Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Clear to Sand podcast. We actually have a few guests here on the show, and we're also doing this in video, but we're going to talk about Solona and actually see it uh, live, a demo, see how it works, understand some of the concepts that, that Andrew Vonage has talked about in a previous episode. So in this uh, episode, we have Andrew Vonage and also J.R. Rowlandson, with us today and, and as well as your co-host Francois. How are you doing, Francois? I'm good. I'm good. Excited about this one. Yeah, this is going to be good. We don't do too many live demos. So if you're listening to the audio, head over to the show notes, uh, go to cleardescent.net, uh, do a search for um, Salona, and you may just be able to, to check out this demo because if you're watching via audio, it, it's going to be worth it looking at this via video. Andrew, how, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. It's uh, it's nice fall weather here in Nebraska. Getting my sweater on. Uh, I'm a sweater person, <laughs> so uh, loving it right now. All right, and uh, we have Jr. How are you doing, Jr.? Yeah, lovely, beautiful, sunny day again here in uh, downtown San Jose. Doing great. Yeah, so we see you're outdoors. Where are you exactly in San Jose? I'm actually connected. Um, via my iPad Pro on the Salona CBRS network that we have deployed at SJSU, at San Jose State University. So it's uh, pretty exciting, but right. not as exciting as being on uh, CTS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for, for joining us. And it's great to see that you're actually joining Zoom via the CBRS network. So this is going to be a test for you guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how how this goes. Um, obviously, you're outside, so if you hear any background noise, just that's just the nature of San Jose, and you know weird things happen at San Jose as well. So, <laughs> I think I think it's nice to see the evolution of Sirona because remember when we started to yeah. talk about the company it was Mobility Field Day, maybe uh, two years back now, and they would just introduce the, the company, and it was just like the very beginning. And then at WLPC last year, Andrew set up a first like test network at the conference. And now we can actually see that, you know, you could actually deploy it and use it in production and in, in a, you know, on a, on campus at four universities. So it's nice to see, I think it's nice to see the evolution of the company. Yeah. So Andrew, why don't I kick it off to you and you could provide some updates and, and some capabilities of what we're going to see here today in this in this demo, because I think this is a good solution for a lot of different uh, use cases. And we may even get to that as well near the end of this episode. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, previously, um, when I was on your show, we talked more generically about CBRS and LTE and 5G as technologies. Um, we're a little bit further along now from a Salona perspective, and we've got um, an exciting, um, you know, product launch coming up. So we're able to share more information with you about our actual product and solutions and, uh, and, and some of those details. So really excited to share, share that information with you and um, more excited for the sharing of the demo that JR is going to do and talking through that. So I'm going to maybe share a couple of um, more technical slides just so I can frame up the architecture, what it looks like what components are involved. We'll spend very minimal time. And, um, you know, I'm only doing it via slides because uh, I don't have a whiteboard here in my home office. Otherwise I'd, you know, be an engineering whiteboard for you, but, um, but we'll do so. We'll just do a couple of slides just to show everybody what that looks like. So maybe if I go ahead and share those. Are you referring to UC's whiteboard? No, no, I'm just okay. generically like, uh, I did, okay. does UC have a whiteboard? <laughs> yeah, he, he actually has a whiteboard at home. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I wish I had one as well. So I'm going to have to get some tips from UC. Um, yeah, so just to frame up the conversation, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just to give people a highlight. So as JR goes to the demo, you understand how all these pieces fit together. Um, we really focus on providing an end-to-end -end solution for cellular and private networks in an enterprise. So I think that's a pretty important distinction that we have is that there's a lot of cellular providers out there that provide uh, pieces and parts of a solution that maybe aren't necessarily adapted uh, to fit the enterprise vertical or private mobile networks specifically. They're more geared for other telcos or service providers, and they just fit a very niche use case to be plugged into a, a larger um, ecosystem or a larger solution. Um, we really feel that adopting this technology in an enterprise setting really requires you to go to one vendor, one manufacturer to be able to get everything you need because a lot of folks aren't 
aren't uh, aren't trained on cellular. They're not cellular experts. The learning curve can be, um, you know, it, it's not insubstantial to, to learn cellular technology. So we want to, you know, simplify that or um, remove the friction to deploying these solutions and getting a network up and running. Uh, to a large degree. So that's the first thing is just, you know, we provide an end-to-end -end solution. So when we look at these uh, components, um, we have the Slona Orchestrator, which is our cloud management portal. Um, it also provides uh, full policy and provisioning of the infrastructure, network visibility from a, a monitoring and support perspective, and also integrates with third-party systems from an API perspective so that whether you're integrating DevOps uh, and programmatically uh, configuring the network infrastructure, you can do that through network as code from other systems, whether those be applications or network infrastructure management solutions that cross multiple different networks or technologies. You can integrate that in through the Salona orchestrator uh, and also provide streaming telemetry APIs out for ongoing operations and, and monitoring and reporting. So if you have uh, you know, a third party network management system, whether that be ServiceNow or something that's homegrown and, 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 and developed in house, you can stream metrics and alerts out to those systems as well. So that's really the Salon orchestrator is that whole management um, and uh, capability there. Now it does, it is AI powered. And so, um, you know, we're, we're at, you know, in the beginning stages of developing our machine learning and AI capabilities. But um, when we get into the, the dynamic uh, possibilities with application recognition and quality of service and security aspects. Uh, a lot of those that are the building blocks that we're building right now with, from a machine learning perspective. Um, and then the second component is the Salona Edge. Uh, this is analogous to the, the mobile network packet core or the uh, what we call an enterprise packet core. So it provides all the standard 3GPP, which is the, um, one of the the technical standards uh, organizations within the cellular world, uh, all the standards based capabilities within a packet core, all the standards compliant interfaces for uh, between the functions that within the packet core as well as to external systems. So whether we're integrating with, um, you know, let's say other service providers and, and roaming scenarios or neutral host scenarios, um, all of those uh, capabilities exist within there. And that also provides the, um, the spectrum management capabilities. So within CBRS, there's you know the spectrum access system and um, spectrum registration and grant process that's handled from what we call a domain proxy within the Salona Edge. So every radio that the Salona Edge manages, it takes on the responsibility for registering those radios and getting spectrum grants for them as well. And that ties into uh, additional functions for what we call self-organizing networks, which is very equivalent to uh, Wi-Fi's RRM capabilities or radio resource management. Although since CBRS is a, a closed loop ecosystem with little outside interference, uh, as well as a closed feedback loop between the clients and the infrastructure, which is a big difference as well, we have a lot more um, confidence in, in the, the dynamic radio management capabilities. Um, and so it's important to note that the Salona Edge is primarily a software defined network or virtualized network function uh, type of solution. It's built with microservices and clustering capability natively that can be deployed in, you know, in, in a virtualization environment, in a cloud environment, or actually can be deployed on bare metal if you'd like. So have all the range of options there. Um, is, it, is it something as a customer that you have to 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 do, or is it something that Celona just uh, handles somewhere in the cloud and and, and just uh, you know maintain? Uh, we provide the Salona Edge as a software download or as an appliance. So you would, okay. uh, you know, when you when you place an order, you don't. Um, how our pricing works is is mainly a subscription based on uh, per AP, and the Salona Edge Packet Core software kind of comes with it. You don't have to license it separately. You can just download as many instances, deploy them where you need them. So if you, um, we'll get into the architecture here in a minute, but you can deploy them centrally in a data center. You can deploy other instances locally on site depending on where you want traffic to flow in the network. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the third piece is the Salona RAN or the radio access network. This is the hardware component within our solution, indoor and outdoor access points, dual radio, two by two MIMO each, um, you know, for those indoor and outdoor environments. Um, and then we also provide the Salona SIMs or uh, subscriber identity modules. 
And so in, in CBRS and, and in LTE, there's no concept of open networks or pre-shared key networks. Everything is authenticated very securely through these SIMs. And so we provide physical and or eSIMs to go into those client devices so they can authenticate and get on the network. And so all four of those kind of combined are an end-to-end -end solution. You have management, you have the packet core, which is um, termination of traffic tunnels from the APs. You have the APs themselves and you have the, um, the SIMs for authentication. Okay, so the SIMs would go into the devices that would be using the, um, would be using uh, CBRS. And I assume that traffic over the air is also already encrypted somehow. Uh, yep, yep, fully encrypted with AES-256. Okay. And then it's important from a security standpoint to note as well that uh, the Salona Edge and the Salona Radios um, are fully, uh, their, their control plane and management planes are all fully secured with TLS certificates and mutual authentication back to the Salona orchestrator as well. So um, everything is you know secure by default. It's like a little cellular package that you see from you know your Verizons and AT and T's, and you're just putting it into your environment. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, that's that's a good you know distinction point is that this is a fully private network. You own it, you manage it, you maintain it. You can optionally you know have a managed service provider deploy it and manage it for you, but this is not going to Verizon. It's not going to AT and T. It's not going to one of those uh, mobile network operators. This is fully you know, owned and operated under your control. So you have complete control over where you deploy the APs, where traffic flows from a, you know, an architecture perspective, whether it stays locally or it goes back to a data center. You have full visibility of the clients and the data that they're using. Um, and you also don't have a subscription charge with it from an MNO. So you don't pay, you don't have metered data essentially. You can use as much data over this network as you want. And you know, it's just like a, a private, uh, you know, a private network. And I had a, I had a question related to how you can integrate the data you uh, you getting from the CBRS network to, for instance, the data you could get from a Wi-Fi network. So mm -hmm. maybe maybe we, maybe you, we can go back to that question when we start to talk about you know what you guys are doing uh, for the university in San Jose, uh, and maybe talk about you know how you're able to track different devices as they as they roam between CBRS and Wi-Fi. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely bring that up or, or discuss that. Um, the other aspect then is that we get a lot of questions about is what uh, what devices support CBRS. Don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but this ecosystem is growing quite rapidly. Um, almost all of the cellular chipsets and client devices that are being made by Qualcomm, the, the chipset by Qualcomm, um, supports the CBRS band since late last year, so about a year ago now. Uh, Qualcomm flipped that switch and everything since then supports CBRS. So whether it's a smartphone and, and a, a tablet form factor, whether it's a more um, embedded type device that's for a specific use case, like it's a IoT gateway or a industrial manufacturing gateway that goes on to autonomous vehicles, or even a smart router solution, like going into a public safety vehicle where they have multiple connections and they need to go into a smart router. Um, all of those options are out there. Um, there's ruggedized tablets um, and, and ruggedized type environments. So there's all sorts of, of different devices out there now um, that support the CBRS band and it's growing week by week. Um, no. We do compile a list on our website there at this link, salona.io slash devices. So we keep an updated list there all the time as well, if you want to check it out. And there was a uh, videos from DR's lab <laughs> that tests different devices too on the website. We'll, we'll put a link in the show notes for you guys. Um, so yeah, here's just a look at Salona's architecture in the enterprise. So again, this is an overlay solution to an existing enterprise network. So the access points plug in via ethernet and um, to existing enterprise switches. The indoor AP supports PoE plus, uh, the outdoor AP um, requires DC or AC power. Um, just because of the nature of the, the high power output uh, to 50 watts for large coverage areas, a um, little bit more than, than we, POE can handle today. Um, and then they establish what are called S1 tunnels. Um, S1 is the interface definition for the tunnel that uh, exists in the cellular world. Uh, and those tunnel back to the Salona edge, which is the packet core. So you have flexibility wherever you want to deploy the packet core. It can be centrally located. It can be um, distributed at sites. 
really the key thing here is to understand that the traffic is tunneled back to the packet core and the packet core then forwards that traffic onto the network. So wherever you want uh, client traffic to flow, that's where you want um, want to place those, those uh, packet cores. And the great thing about the Solona solution is you could deploy one packet core that's centralized, or you could deploy a thousand at remote uh, stores you know, nationwide, and there's no cost difference to you. Um, you can deploy one or multiple instances as fit your needs and uh, you know, really based on your own requirements, and it doesn't change the price of the solution. Yeah, because yeah, um, that packet core is a, a virtual machine, right? So that's why you can easily deploy that anywhere. Correct. Yep. It's built off containers and microservices. Uh, we actually do Kubernetes clustering under the covers and um, you could deploy one or multiple nodes or what they call Kubernetes hosts and uh, you can deploy them, you know, yeah, wherever you want it in a virtualized environment. How much does a operator need to know about that, right? The Kubernetes, the VM itself, underlying technologies. Is that something that a, a skill set that somebody would need in order to deploy this? Or is it more like a package and there's not much they really have, they don't really have to get under the hood to troubleshoot anything? Yeah, today it's a package. They don't need to really know anything about the underlying um Kubernetes architecture, um, any of that load balancing, how that happens, or the containers within the solution. Um, all of that is kind of abstracted. The, the access points in the Solana Edge are zero touch provisioned. Uh, our goal is so you never have to log into either of those devices. They call back to the Solana orchestrator in the cloud at the management portal. They self provision based on the policy you have in the cloud. And uh, that allows the APs and the, the packet cores to establish relationships of which one uh, which APs should should tunnel traffic to which packet core, as well as policies from uh, from a configuration standpoint, from a security, from a QoS, all of that is handled within the Solana Orchestrator web UI or APIs, and then really you just plug in the APs and and deploy the the virtual machines. Okay, that's great. Uh, in the future, you know, we are looking at potentially, you know, opening that up so that you have more control over like the clustering capability, but uh, that's just a, a future enhancement that would require a customer to know, you know, have their own Kubernetes um, orchestration up and running and uh, provide a little bit more, you know, granular control of that. But for today, uh, to keep it kind of frictionless, it's just a package. And you manage um, all of them and you configure all of them from the dashboard, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. There's a, a concept of hierarchical sites that JR will probably go into with his demo um, that establish relationships between APs and, and packet cores and, and policy management. The other big thing to, to note from an architectural perspective, and this is just another view that I'm showing here, is um, potentially two sites um, that have different architectures coexisting within the same environment. So you might have a site here on the left that has a centralized, relies on centralized compute. So maybe there's no server infrastructure at this site, um, and we need, and there's no local traffic requirement at this site. All applications are centralized in a data center, or in a cloud, or they're SaaS based. So in that case, those APs would, from a policy perspective, be configured to tie back to the centralized Solana Edge cluster for services. They would tunnel all that traffic back to the data center or to the cloud. And that's where that traffic would get forwarded out into the network for the application access. So very minimal uh, edge requirements at that point, other than deploying access points. And then in the same in customer environment, you could have maybe other sites that do have edge compute um, that have servers on site that have a virtualization stack or a mobile edge compute platform. Uh, and they do have local applications that uh, require low latency access or, or direct access from within the, the site. And here we can deploy a, a separate instance of the Solana Edge on site, on premises, and we can forward traffic directly into the local network for low latency access. Some use cases that uh, you know need this are you know, your traditional warehousing, logistics, um, manufacturing environments, as well as uh, new use cases around autonomous vehicles, uh, ultra reliable, low latency connectivity for AR or VR applications, uh, things of that nature. So, um, and we can support all of this within one environment that can be all managed through the Solana orchestrator. Okay. Any questions on the architecture maybe before I hand it over to JR to, to jump into a demo? Makes sense to me. Yeah, it's, uh, it makes sense to me as well. And you have uh, on your website, I'm guessing you guys have documentation now with 
that would detail this um, if, if people want more information, right? Yeah, yeah. Either our main website, uh, go to salona.io, and there's a resources tab at the top of the web page. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all of our documentation, more specifically, is at uh, the URL docs.salona.io. Awesome. Um, you know, the other thing, interesting thing here to, to maybe mention before I uh, hand it over to JR is that um, with the tunneling to the Salona edge, um, you know, a traditional cellular network has no concept of integration with a private network. All of the IP addressing is handled natively by the packet core. Everything is natted out of the packet core to the public internet potentially, or if it's not natted, clients are assigned um, publicly routable IP addresses, whether that be IPv4, or v6. A lot of work at Salona has been going into that native enterprise integration. So we have a lot of options to forward traffic into the customer network using NAT, just acting as a router to route into the customer network or actually forwarding traffic directly into VLANs. And that's more your traditional like kind of layer two type of integration that you may be familiar with mm -hmm. uh, out of the Wi-Fi world is, hey, what, what clients get assigned into what VLANs on my network uh, and things of that nature. So we support a lot of different flexible options there, which is fairly unique as well. So if, if you're roaming from a Wi-Fi network to a CBRS network, could you keep the same like IP connection, layer three connection? Uh, no, they're going to be different interfaces on the client for one. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to okay. you're going to have a Wi-Fi interface, and you're going to have a CBRS or a cellular interface. Um, so okay. they're going to get two different layer three IP addresses. So, um, but but we can definitely integrate with you know the same VLAN, for instance. The other thing is that the um, you know cellular devices don't have MAC addresses, and when we get into IP address handling and integration with an enterprise network. Um, the DHCP server would probably, you know, recognize those as two different um, clients as well, and uh -huh. not be able to maintain the same IP address lease and things like that. So, so what does it mean in terms of application? Do you did you guess test the the handover and try to see the impact of different type of applications that that could cause? Yeah, I think that's probably a, a good point for JR to jump in because JR has done a lot of testing, like specifically with, um, let's say, voice applications and handing mm -hmm. off between technologies. Um, and we do see that work pretty seamlessly um, without a, a large break. And maybe I'll let JR tackle that one. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I think I, I haven't actually done a lot of the handover testing that's been handled by um, two of my colleagues, uh, Jeremy Fu and Vinay Anabonia, who's uh, one of our co-founders. And as part of um, some due diligence work we were doing with a partner, we um, did um, some extensive handover testing and um, LTE obviously has um, very advanced mechanisms built in to handle um, handover um, far in advance of anything that, that Wi-Fi can offer. Um, and that's mature technology. So it was really just a case of proving that within our um, technology platform, within our technology stack, that we could handle the, um, the same types of uh, low latency, uh, seamless handover that you see um, Hopefully, when you're roaming around an MNO network in a city, we all know that sometimes we're going to sell handover in it and it glitches a little bit. But no, the uh, testing we've seen has been um, uh, pretty um, positive, and we've seen very good handover rates on voice applications and video applications. So we've been doing some pretty hardcore testing in the last few months. Yeah, and just to highlight that, you know, the Wi-Fi calling feature within most smartphones actually works over CBRS as well. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at like your Verizon phone and you enable Wi-Fi calling and then you're out of Verizon coverage area and you go into your own Wi-Fi, you can still establish, you know, those voice calls over Wi-Fi. Well, actually that's, you know, kind of abstracted. It's just, it's just a voice over a separate backhaul other than your uh, MNO subscription. So that works over, over CBRS as well. If you if you wanted to hand off between a voice call between uh, an MNO and then CBRS private network, as long as that Wi-Fi calling feature is enabled in most of those smartphones, that works just fine. Okay, yeah, and I'm wondering as well for more like you know manufacturing environment where uh, devices might have different you know other type of application, maybe like a telnet application. Um, I'm wondering if you know that handover will still work because. Sometimes in warehouses, we see a lot of issues with roaming and, and you know, yeah. building that connection. Quite frankly, our recommendation is for those mission critical applications, uh, keep them on one technology or another. 
Okay. And obviously we think that CBRS can provide a lot of benefits with QoS and service levels to guarantee performance. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're advising customers of if, if an application is critical, uh, put it on CBRS uh, and we can hand over between our own APs seamlessly. Yeah. And, and that would be the preferred route to go. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I okay. think that makes a lot of sense too for those mission critical locations because of the amount of control you have over that traffic then then that's where you would use things like your your micro slicing and QoS. Yeah, and there are there are more options coming through with devices in terms of how you can uh, leverage the intelligence in the device to move traffic. So you can with Windows has the capability in their laptops now to assign specific applications to um, the LTE, the CBRS mobile connection. Um, and um, the uh, sorry, <laughs> message um, yeah. So the um, I completely lost my train of thought. I just had a message come through yeah. on my phone. Sorry, we're, no, we're no, you were talking about the fact. Yeah, talking about the fact that devices are becoming smarter in the way they handle the traffic. So you could have yeah. multiple connections back to the network, and then the device could choose which one to use depending on which application. So yeah, like web so applications you, will natively typically use whatever backhaul they support. So if you have a, a native web app, uh, it should work seamlessly between technologies as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's, you guys want to do the demo? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> I'll leave my video running because it's, uh, you'll see in a second how I have my laptop uh, connected to the CBRS network as well. Um, nice. But first off, we'll start with um, the uh, network here at SJSU. We had a requirement where um, obviously we'd done some extensive testing with our indoor APs and we did an outdoor environment where we could continue with that and testing things like handover. There's an awful lot of uh, interest right now on um, automatic guided vehicles, remote operated vehicles in uh, logistics and warehousing, things like that. So, you know, that, that uh, application requires very predictable network performance and, and CBRS is able to deliver that. So our SGSU network is really, you know, thank, thanks to uh, Shai and the team here at SGSU has helped us test those, those applications. And uh, also they're looking at how they can use CBRS. Now, I am currently sat where the little point is um, here on the map. And uh, that is on our um, predictive analysis that is just zoom out get the right spot approximately here so we have at SGSU we have two outdoor APs in the main campus um, providing a pretty much 100% coverage within the main campus area downtown which is uh, what is that eight blocks by five um, it's about uh, 5 million square feet, I think, the central campus. And uh, we recently deployed one down at their south campus as well for coverage of their sports um, fields down there so that they can start to do some live streaming video. Um, so that's what we have uh, deployed here currently. Um, I'm on the main campus, as, as we said, and that's, that is the uh, Google Network Planner tool, the predictive analysis based on uh, someone being at ground level with a handheld device. So, you know, you can see I'm in a, I'm in a very good coverage area here um, and uh, I'm not cheating. Normally I sit much farther away, but they're digging it up today. So uh, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a different location. Um, so that is our network. We have uh, two APs with four sectors, uh, the 90 degree sectors each. And we have, um, a, well, and I was talking the other day, we have actually tested out to three miles. I was on the limits of usability at that point, but to give you an idea of, uh, what, how far the signal will travel in, in clear air. We were able to establish a link and, and uh, transmit data out at three miles, which was, I'll show you on the map. That's not showing it here, but basically in the south end of uh, San Jose down here. So yeah, we have our outdoor network. We have here. 5 million square feet of coverage. Sorry, uh, no, we have a question roll. It was on Communications Hill. I remember you shared that on the Salona forums, and I was just I was looking at it, going, "Wait, you you have this in San Jose State, but you were you were able to send traffic up in Communications Hill, which is about three three point three miles away from the university." Yeah, and as I said, 
you know, that was at the limit of usability. Um, if you were re truly building out to cover all of all of San Jose, you'd have a lot more um, cells. But it was a, you know, it was a very good opportunity to see just how far um, a standard deployment would reach. So in terms of managing the network day to day, um, we use, as, as Andrew mentioned, we use the Salona Service Orchestrator. This is the network management window and everything that happens on the network. Um, there are no different interfaces to interface with the uh, APs. Um, there are no different interfaces to interface with the Salona Edge Appliance or Virtual Machine. Everything is managed from uh, Salona Service Orchestrator. Um, and what you see is our um, front end on the CSO API. Um, everything um, within the system is accessible via API. So if any client has a particular OSS BSS or network management platform, they can integrate all of their activities into the, into the um, Salona platform and, and pull data from it. Now you'll see we have at the moment, uh, you'll see here we have micro slicing metrics. Micro slicing is our QoS, it's how we classify traffic. Currently, we're just running one here, one default class, so we're not we're not slicing on this particular network right now. But I'll show you how to configure one in a minute. But we'll go through first the um, how you would configure a site. It's actually very simple. Um, let's go to sites, and I won't add a new one, but we'll just go through the, this. This is the uh, first step of of creating your site. Um, you give it a name, you give it the location. In a few moments, we'll see a, uh, a real-time view of the um, spectrum availability. Um, and then you assign access points to it from your inventory. Um, Salona will assign all your assets, whether they be virtualized or um, physical assets like indoor and outdoor APs. And you as the administrator just go in and assign them to specific sites. Now you can um, pre-deploy everything. So the Salona Edge Appliance or Virtual Machine could be already deployed into your network. The indoor, indoor and outdoor APs could be deployed and in the air connected, have IPs and be in communication with the Salona platform um, in the cloud, just waiting for instruction on how they should be configured. Um, and the moment that you create that site and assign those assets to it, that's when all the auto configuration begins. So, okay. Uh, the uh, Salona Edge, which, as Andrew mentioned, is is um, kind of a little like a Wi-Fi controller, but has a lot of the uh, network function uh, contained in there, um, handles all of our routing and all of our interfacing with the enterprise network. And um, as Andrew mentioned, our platform was designed from the ground up to be integrated into, into a regular everyday enterprise network. One of the challenges with that is um, things like layer two don't exist. So we have to do an awful lot of um, work in the background to connect the radio side of the uh, CBRS LT network to the enterprise LAN side. And that's what Salona Edge is taking care of, um, which is why obviously you'll want to see information about what is happening with it. You'll see we have uh, some gaps here right now. There's a new release that's coming out tonight, which all of that information will be filled in. Um, we can, you know, you will be able to see performance data. And um, if at any point you're seeing um, performance issues, you can see uh, what's happening on the edge appliance here. The uh, access points, uh, very simple. Obviously, again, you look into the access point detail and you'll see that we have um, some bits of information here. Again, there is more coming uh, with tonight's release. But right now you can see we have the installation parameters, and this is the part where uh, the CPI, the Certified Professional Installer, is required to input this information and certify that it is correct. Um, that's where um, the uh, CPI becomes important um, to, uh, in order to comply with the uh, SEC specification and receive your grant from the Spectrum Access Service. So in future, other things we'll be showing here is the frequencies you've been, you've been assigned and the transmit powers and uh, number of UEs connected, things like that. UEs are clients in LTE speak. I'm caught between different worlds transitioning from Wi-Fi to LTE. Um, so those are the infrastructure elements, the access points and the um, clusters. Are there any questions so far, gents? 
yeah, um, looking at the the edge clusters, I, I, you said you're pushing out an update that kind of shows the the performance of the cluster. Now, if you were to have an issue with maybe one of those edge nodes, is it would it be as simple as bringing another one up and ha having that traffic now go through another node, for example? So this is where probably Andrew can answer this better, but the way that we have built out that core stack in the, in the edge, um, whether it be an appliance or VM, is that everything has scalable and the uh, scalable services in the Kubernetes clusters. So everything can be scaled out as and when necessary based on the number of clients you have connected, the amount of traffic being um, throughput, et cetera. So um, there is a scalability and redundancy built in because you can have multiple clusters as part of um, an edge. So you have Solana Edge, which can be made up of multiple clusters. So with whatever, if one does have an issue, the other clusters will take over. It's fully within. Yeah. So maybe just to, to color that a little bit more right. is that, um, you know, Solana Edge is a logical packet core that's made up of multiple um, Kubernetes hosts. So I think the minimum that we recommend for resiliency and, and handling of a, a failure event for one of those nodes is um, a three or four node cluster. Um, now, Kubernetes load balances uh, incoming traffic from APs and clients to the nodes within that cluster or the Kubernetes hosts. And so if one of those nodes does fail, um, the Kubernetes load balancer just takes it out of rotation. So um, it flags there's an issue and just doesn't send traffic to it and it migrates the state of the existing connections over to another node. So you can have seamless kind of failover there within the cluster. Um, and then to scale out or to you know resolve a, a failure event, yeah, you can simply just deploy another VM as a Kubernetes host, uh, you add ad additional worker nodes into the cluster, um, and that provides both um, resolution of those failure events as well as scale out. So uh, you can scale out horizontally as your deployment grows is, is kind of the second key benefit there is that you can start small, maybe with a small environment for just a handful of, of APs. And as you grow, handle more APs, more traffic, you can add just additional worker nodes into the cluster and you don't really have to forklift out, add additional licensing, anything of that, just add in additional um, worker node resources and, and away you go to handle more traffic and more APs. Um, and, and the one th additional thing I'll point out is that um, this clustering does work. It can be spread across uh, multiple geo locations. So you could have, um, and we're testing the limits of that now, but uh, you can have multiple worker nodes in the same cluster that are geographically diverse at different data centers and things of that nature, so. Okay. I had the question related to the access point in the previous episode, we talked about the fact that when an access point comes on, uh, you're gonna have some sort of validation uh, done to make sure, or to define exactly which frequency can be used, which channel can be used. Is that done based on the address that you specify for the site? Or is that done, you know, whenever you certify that you've entered the proper information? At Not AP at the site, level. it's it's done at the AP level. So maybe JR, okay. if you want to go back to the access point, go to those CPI installation parameters. Um, for yeah. each access point, you're putting in a latitude longitude that's very specific. So the accuracy required by the SAS vendors is 50 meters horizontal and uh, I can't remember, I think it might be like six meters, I want to say vertical, maybe three mm -hmm. meters. I can't remember exactly. I have to go back, look it up, but you have okay. some flexibility in there, but yeah, you can have it. We definitely don't go off the site information. It's per access point specifically. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and once sense. it's uh, validated by a certified installer. Yeah. And so the other thing is the indoor and outdoor APs both have built in GPS. Uh, indoors, it may be a little bit uh, harder to acquire that GPS signal. So you can put it in manually. But if it can be automatically gathered via the in internal built-in GPS, it will be. Awesome. Okay. So we'll move on to um, the devices management. So this is where you manage your um, users, essentially, um, or connected devices. We have obviously you see we can create groups for different devices at the moment everything is in um default i may have moved a couple yeah, no, a couple of the cctv um but right now my two currently connected devices are um this one right here 
12, and I, it shows I have the IP address 12118 and uh, 12114, I think, is uh, the iPad. So we have both of those devices connected, and you can see their, their state. Um, we can create a device group, and that would be for anything logical. So, for example, if you had um, point of sale tablets your requirement for that traffic is going to be slightly different to anyone who's going to be using something like Zoom, Classroom, or anything like that. So um, point of sale, we would put them in a different um, uh, group so that we can then manage their traffic down the line. Um, you can see the various device groups here. Okay, so, so I would imagine that the, the, the device groups is your way to distinguish QoS for whatever types of devices are in those groups. Yeah, it's it's one of the first sort of building blocks of being able to do that. So the first one would be let's group our devices together who are going to be using a particular application, and you can um, both uh, tailor QoS for a device if you wanted to globally or a group of devices globally. You can also tailor. Um, different applications on those devices. So you can set different application performance levels for different applications on the same device, which is pretty cool. You know, for someone like me who had, you know, the nightmare of trying to connect to thousands and point of sale tablets with, um, excuse my language, shitty um, Wi-Fi drivers um, <laughs> in, a, in a music festival, this type, this type of, of uh, flexibility is, is just, you know, it's just a godsend. It's all the things I ever dreamed of. Um, so we have, um, once we have a group, we can then create an application. So we can say, okay, well, we're going to continue on. It's going to be a point of sale application. And we're just going to say that there is a um, point of sale application server, all the traffic goes to and from it. And we're going to give it, we're going to make that a slash 32 so that any traffic that the Salona Edge now sees destined for 10.10.0.101, it knows that that is a point of sale application. Um, we could do destination start and end ports, source IP, um, source start and end ports. We can even use DSCP markings. So if you're introducing DSCP, we can pick those up and classify traffic on that as well. Now, this to me is the promise of intent-based networking. Here's my application. This is what I want to do with it. I don't want to have to write ACLs and QoS rules for every single device it's going through. I just want to say, treat this application better than others. Um, so we have that part. We have now added that application. That information is now being passed from CSO down to the Salona Edge. Um, and the exciting part, the microslicing part, and that's our name for the uh, QoS application or QoS and policy management services. We create a microslice for point of sale. Yeah, let's give this one more pepperoni. I like that. I like that little icon for your micro slicing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, give it a bit of pepperoni. Um, okay, so in terms of guaranteed bitrate, we don't really mind because most point of sale applications don't require high bitrate. Um, it is, you know, very small packet sizes. So, but we do want to introduce something. And the upstream and downstream are both equally important because you've got traffic going up and down. So we'll just say we'll do a minimum uh, one up. That's going to be a guaranteed level. Um, I can put a max on there as well. So I can say those devices can't um, use any more than two. Um, and then on the downstream side, again, I can say one and one. Now, because I'm doing point of sale, what I'm interested in is a very low latency. I want those transactions to come through as fast as possible. This is me configuring point of sale for a music festival. I need those lines as short as possible so I can sell as much beer as possible. Yeah, um, I'm assuming so, those, what, what are those val uh, other options there? Because you, you picked real time and control, but it says QCI, PDB. Are those kind of your um, Salona's recommended values? And are those something that operators should configure their own, for example? So there are, um, Andrew can probably give you more detail on the various QCI levels that are built into the LTE spec, but there are, um, we show four currently, 
I believe there's eight or nine. Andrew, chime in. Yeah, uh, we, we have support for all nine. So what you'll find yeah. is the first four uh, are apply to guaranteed bitrate traffic. Uh, the last, the second four apply to non-guaranteed bitrate traffic. So if you select the different option up above, you'd see QCI's um, five through eight. And then QCI nine is kind of um, best effort default queue. So um, these are built into the 3GPP standard for LTE and 4G. Um, they are, you know, you, they're defined in the standard essentially. Um, and what that means is um, they have a QCI, which is class identifier. Um, and then they have a packet delay budget, which is uh, what should the, the latency be uh, applied to that traffic. Uh, they have a packet and error loss rate. Uh, so you see there on highest priority is 10 to the minus six. So um, you do the math on uh, that fractional amount of, of traffic that should be able to be lost. Um, and then it also has built in uh, delay or excuse me, jitter budgets as well. So it's, it's all kind of classifying what your throughput should be, what your latency should be, what your uh, packet loss target should be. And if you're not meeting that criteria, that's kind of when micro slicing kicks in at either the radio layer or the packet core layer to improve that traffic flow and give it more resources. So whether that's scheduling traffic over the air or whether that's uh, giving it more compute and memory resources from a, a packet core perspective to, to serve that traffic category, that's what happens. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. I think you, you might be muted. So wrapping up, I'll just quickly apply this micro slice to everyone in the default group. I'm not picking a particular group. It's every device that's in default will receive highest priority signaling, um, and best effort, and the custom application is the pause application. So any device in the default group that starts trans transmitting traffic to that address will be sliced and given priority across the network. Um, and then that obviously any policies that you have on the enterprise side can also be um, it can be integrated with that whether that be a vlan or um, uh, a particular routed domain so speaking of vlans and integrating with the network um, we can create let's just say for example you do have a, a vlan for your point of sale application we can say uh, same server and that uses VLAN 101 and what will happen then is that the uh, Solana edge will create a new interface on its trunk uh, on that VLAN and proxy any request for DHCP from devices that match that group to that DHCP server on your enterprise lab so there are you know we we have built in a number of different ways that you can either connect to a VLAN or just connect to a routed subnet um, using the, the intelligence in the Solana Edge. So no matter what your enterprise um, deployment model, we can integrate with it, which is really important. Back in 2017, when I first tested um, a buy sales LTE kit, a three and a half gig, um, I was at uh, Austin City Limits. It worked great, but I couldn't use it because it didn't support my VLANs. So, um, you know, that was, that was uh, three years ago and now here we are and we have a, a fully integratable um, platform that delivers QoS to, to um, end devices on a per application basis, which for me is, is really exciting. Yeah, I like that you, can, that you can add the VLAN because that's very common to us Wi-Fi guys, right? We attach a VLAN to a WLAN and that's how you can drop the clients onto that network. Now, uh, Andrew, I'm assuming if you've got API and you got multiple sites, you can probably just have that deploy. Like, let's say you have a, a set of VLANs across every site, you can just deploy that through API. Or are there uh, something like a template that they could use to deploy uh, the same set of VLANs everywhere? Absolutely, everything is API driven. So, if you needed to script out, uh, you know, deployment of a hundred or a thousand sites, and they had some pro programmatic way of determining which VLANs go to which site, you can script all of that and push it to us and it'll be done like that. So um, yeah, fully, fully API driven. Okay, great. And but the other thing, you know, I mean, you mentioned that that's, you know, kind of native to the Wi-Fi world with that, you know, VLAN integration. And, you know, a lot of people may be listening or watching and saying, well, what's great about that? And I think that the difference is that's not common in the cellular world. 
yeah. almost nobody does this. So to have that capability is really what we're striving to do is to, to match those private enterprise networking needs that you're used to. Yeah, it really is the superpower on top of LTE. Um, while Andrew is speaking, I just uh, flicked through a few screens. Um, NPerf, shout out to the guys there, is a great speed test tool. I'm just running an NPerf on the device I'm connected to. So I have my MacBook and um, I am, as you can see, connected using uh, my battery pack. And that is an, an AMIT simple gateway, Ethernet gateway. Um, I still have my Zoom call going, no problem at all. And uh, streaming the video out. And we're doing the speed test and that's because we have a, a very comprehensive and very, very balanced round robin scheduler that deals with all of the traffic. We can do a lot of this uh, tailoring because it's TDD. Yeah, and the other thing, we have performance kind of um, guidelines on our website. If you go to that docs.salona.io uh, to give you, you know, a, a feel of what you should be able to expect on a, on a Salona AP. Um, the other thing to, to note is that because LTE schedules uplink versus downlink, it's you know, that um, the cell capacity is really the, the combination of both. You're never going to get the, the full cell capacity on either uplink or downlink because we're always preserving that waiting ratio to make sure we have don't starve other traffic. So kind of unlike Wi-Fi where you can you know burst to the, the peak capacity on either direction. Right now with LTE, it's 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 you know. Uh, weighted so that uh, nothing can consume the entire the entire cell. Yeah, I gotcha. Because we're not th this solution is not meant to provide the the largest throughput for devices. Typically, what we associate with Wi-Fi um, here, we're talking about mission critical applications. So yes, you gotta slice that that airtime for those different applications. But uh, Jay, I wanted uh, you to share again your setup at the table because I uh, sure. didn't talk about how, yes, you're using a tablet or a laptop to co connect to um, to the CBRS network, but your device may not have the radio capability built in, right? So you're, you're, you, you, it looks like you were using a different way to connect to that network. And this is kind of what I wanted to express to other people as well is you may have a device that is not capable of these frequencies, but there is a way to get it attached to that network. Yeah. So one of the things that um, we've, we've had a lot of requests for, as you can imagine, is um, people want to be able to move their IP cameras around. So working with a sort of small device like this, nice ruggedized, this is the, uh, turn it right around. This one is the AMIT IDG 500. Um, similar form factor to things like Multitech eCell. Um, great performance, um, you know, low power requirement. That's five volt, two amps. You could run it off a USB power pack if need be. Yeah. So, while well, you got some background noise there, and and some of the maybe uh, objections that people might have is, well, in my environment, I have really old devices, and I can't upgrade those, or it costs millions of dollars to try to forklift this upgrade um, mm -hmm. and you can attach these little that little gateway thing that you, you showed there yeah. and as long as you've got that ethernet connection um, you could then have it now running on a network where you could really start using qos and low latency yeah, yeah. and those adapters are fairly cost effective as well we see them in use for a lot of those legacy devices that are uh, in manufacturing or uh, video camera for CCTV access, things of that nature. Yeah. They, they we have, a, sorry, uh, the the cleaners are just coming around. But um, yeah, the one uh, thing as well is that um, there are USB devices. So for example, I'm, I'm a big fan of using an ethernet bridge because it's just so simple. Um, but there's a lot of devices that don't have an ethernet port. So, you know, there are USB devices that you can plug in they're typically multifunction, better on Windows than Linux and, and, and uh, Mac OS. But, um, you know, you do have those options. They exist right now and they do work. Yeah. And we have a full list of those again on our website, salona.io forward slash devices. Okay. And yeah. And you will yeah. see more videos in JR's lab coming in the next few weeks as well. So you'll right. get those at salona.io also. There's one thing that you didn't show, which is um, you've configured the the network, the devices to join, but what if somebody wanted to see how it was working or maybe there's a device that is having an issue. How does one try to troubleshoot a scenario like that or even validate that 
they are getting you know the, the right amount of signal signal strength the they are getting their slice of the pie there or the pizza uh, when you're doing your micro slicing how do you confirm something like that yeah, so today what's in the CSO is our basic metrics for uh, connectivity, up down of infrastructure devices, throughput, and those metrics for throughput, latency, jitter, um, packet error rate on a micro slice basis. Um, we actually have a client diagnostics um, tool and metrics coming in in our next release here in a couple of weeks that bring a lot of those functionality into the solution so that you can diagnose at a more granular level. Um, and then those will be also be available um, potentially via through the API as well to stream out to third-party systems. So kind of one of those, you know, uh, things that are evolving as we grow as a company and, and uh, expand our, our capabilities. I would say even if you have the, you just said it, the API, then you could push that to uh, an open source dashboard or something to keep track of all these devices. Yep, absolutely. We're actually running, I think, in our, for our own internal troubleshooting some Grafana dashboards and things like that. So, awesome. That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, and just as an extension to the, um, the thing around quality and around uh, monitoring application performance, um, Preeti and, and the team on the AI side uh, doing a lot of work around monitoring traffic, um, seeing how it's performing, and then the AI will 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 get to the point where it can make recommendations about how you can improve. Um, performance. So, you know, the goal is to get to the point that before you, the user calls you and says, oh, I'm having, a, you know, an issue here, the application's slow, you'll know the network will have already told you and given you some ways, some suggested ways to improve. All right. So to kind of close out the episode, you're there at San Jose State. Can you speak to why they um, have attempted to look at this solution? What is the use case, the real world use case here for, for San Jose so, State specifically? Yeah, there's, there's some really interesting ones actually. Um, there's a few which we've seen and a few which are quite unique. So um, one, obviously outdoor coverage. Here I am, I'm sat outside the Clark building. There are a bunch of tables and chairs and, and umbrellas and things. And working outside is something that students here do an awful lot um, when, when the campus is fully open. So they do have outdoor Wi-Fi coverage, but as you can imagine, it's kind of challenging. You have big open spaces, it's just not gonna reach. So there's that side, um, uh, just you know, broad coverage for, for staff and, and, and other people to access. Now they're holding classes in, in such uh, interesting places as parking garages. So there are dance classes and um, bands takes place in the parking garage on 10th Street. Um, so they needed a quick way to get coverage into there and then plug in on the back, POE switch, AP, usual coverage. Um, down at their South Campus, um, we are working on providing their video team who do, you're gonna have to excuse a British person's understanding of American college sports here, i.e. none. Um, they're streaming live like practice and Pac-10 games and things like that, both with soccer and football. And that's a roving camera with a CBRS LTE backpack, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the ability to get situational information um, from security uh, staff. So whether it be a vehicle that maybe uh, SGSU PD are in, because they have everything from usual cruisers to small uh, Kubotas, um, but to get real-time situational video from an incident is really important. So that's one of the other applications we're looking at here. That's really cool. Yeah, and you guys do have a video where uh, they talk about the different use cases for the university. So we'll we'll share that as well with the with the podcast. Um, thank you for demoing the uh, the setup. I think it's. Uh, I mean, if we compare that to how we deploy Wi-Fi, it looks very simple, right? Uh, even if if uh, you know, when as Wi-Fi guys, we we might be a little afraid of a new technology. I think it's it's very um, easy to integrate. It looks like it's very easy to integrate. Um, obviously, you, you know, we didn't show the, you know, how to set up the, the edge and how to integrate that into the customer environment. So I don't know how that piece is, how hard that piece is, but in, in terms of configuring everything on the orchest orchestrator, it, it looks pretty straightforward. Yeah. I mean, just to address that real quick, it's, it's everything that JR showed in the orchestrator. You could configure your site, you add in your edge cluster and your APs to the site, and then you configure your policies. And really, it's just turning on the edge and the, the APs at that point. Make sure they have 
routing back for management. That's cool. Awesome. So, um, Jay, are you Jay's muted? muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, it feels weird to say sometimes that you don't have to do channel planning anymore, which mm -hmm. is someone with 20 years of Wi Fi from like 802.11b doing it at shows and schools and everything else is just no channel planning. <laughs> I was um, the, the biggest proponent of static channel planning with Wi Fi, and I still am today. Um, but yeah, it just it's completely, you know, upends everything you think you know about radio planning when it's a different protocol. It works differently, and yeah, I mean, you look, you just look at a speed test and or uh, you know connectivity, and you're like, okay, what's different? And yeah. there's just so much under the covers that is is completely different. It's it's yeah. amazing. Same and different, you know, at the same time. It's like a lot of the things are similar and a lot of things are different. It's just kind of navigating that and learning what right. what is what those are. Yeah, for the end user, it's nothing to them, right? They don't care. They just need that connectivity. But what they will notice is maybe an uh, extra boost in in that reliability of that connection, uh, whether that's uh, real time traffic that they're looking at, um, maybe less jitter on their end, uh, and then of course uh, different frequencies that we're playing with here. So it, it's a it, it, it's a lot more, I guess, controlled. So we have. Um, we have more to work with there, right? So less interference that we're dealing with. But I do like the simplicity of the configuration, right? I, there was only like maybe six uh, sections on the left side there of the navigation. And, and then even when you were in the section, just a couple of drop boxes and you're, you're off and running and you're doing uh, a speed test. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, thank I'll, you. That's I'll, a, I'll, a pretty big focus I'll. for us is to try to keep that, you know, achievable for for people who don't know cellular um and the other thing i think is you know is great is that you know um, lte is scheduled it has its own benefits for reliability and and guaranteed bit rate and qos you know stuff that's very controlled and then wi-fi has uh, other advantages where it's peak capacity and it's a, just a, a ginormous amount of additional spectrum available to it and, and things of that nature and, and we really view those, them as complementary of you know you're going to have use cases where you know, pick the right technology for the right use case. And, and it's more driven by what you're trying to achieve, not just some adherence to one way or another way, right? Yeah, and we're just beginning to see this come into play, right? It, it first starts with these use cases. And I think that's what a lot of people are going to be following is what are what is uh, San Jose State using this for? And, and of course, you'll have other use cases on your website. So maybe that's where we we now end it is, Andrew, where can people find you and, and learn more? And then we'll follow that up with JR. Yeah, absolutely. So just generically, our website is salona.io. Um, we have resources, we have contact information on there. Um, you can sign up for evals and proof of concept and to get your hands on some of the equipment uh, on our website. We're, we're happy to discuss uh, your use cases, help you navigate the environment. Um, you can reach out to us uh, on email for inquiries at hello at salona.io. Um, I'm Andrew at salona.io is, is my, my email. Um, so feel free to to reach out to, to me or anyone generically at the company and we can definitely um, get you on the path to understanding the, the CBRS ecosystem. All right, and you, JR? Yeah, um, uh, I'm fairly active on Twitter. You can find me there, at Rollinson. Um, my, my email is Rollinson at salona.io. Uh, I was the second Jeremy, even though I was employee 20-something, I was the second Jeremy, so hence JR. Um, and uh, JR's lab has um, a YouTube video channel. You can uh, look at all the various device demos on there. And uh, I think this is going out in a couple of weeks. So by then we'll be having fortnightly demos. So anyone who wants to sign up for a demo, we'll be doing them every two weeks and we'll have, you know, micro slice demos to show you. Um, we, you know, we'd love to hear everyone's questions and, and uh, what they're looking forward to, to using this new wireless technology for. Awesome. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you both for coming on to this uh, episode and showing us a demo while using it. Um, at San Jose State, I think that that was pretty good um, to see that worked very smoothly for you and showing us uh, your speed test and really cool look at the uh, the Google Network Planner. I've never really seen that before, but I thought that was something very useful. Francois, you have anything to add? No, oh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe next time we can do a focus on the devices and how you configure them and SIM cards and authentication and all of that. Um, we briefly talked about it, but I would be interested to know how, how it works, how easy is it to onboard 
uh, you know, devices for their customers and stuff like that. Sounds right. great. Thank Absolutely. you. Guys. We appreciate it. Thank you for we having really us. We really appreciate on. it. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you.